Welcome to Season 3, Episode 4, Chronicles of UK Salafism, an insider perspective. This particular episode will focus on the year 2013. However, before proceeding with the details of that year, I want to refer to the previous episode in which I highlighted that unprecedented steps have been taken by Brixton Mosque to lodge official complaints against a few junior Saudi scholars involved in fueling the discord among the Salafis in the West. Concerning my own letter and the steps that were taken after handing that to Sheikh Mohammed bin Hadi's household, I extended the time given for him to provide a response. His failure to respond was unsurprising and I therefore asked my lawyer to issue legal proceedings against him in Jeddah, which was done. Now, some may ask what was the end result of that. After they tried to contact him on a few occasions, they then arranged to transfer the case to Medina. It was at that point that I felt that the message had been resoundedly made to Sheikh Mohammed and I indicated to my lawyer, who had power of attorney to take it as far as it needed to go, that he needn't proceed any further. In order to place a context upon what was actually taking place amongst the Salafi community across the UK and indeed in the US, I'd like to refer to some works that were translated from the classical scholar Al-Hafiz ibn Rajab entitled The Difference Between Advising and Condemning, with a footnote and narrative from Sheikh Ali Hassan um, al-Halabi. And on page 25 of that translation, the title of the section is called Concerning Condemning. And I'll read excerpts from that to emphasise and illustrate what was taking place, the very toxic environment among which Salafis were operating. Quote, from the apparent signs of condemning is exposing someone's evil and propagating it under the pretense of advising while claiming that it is only these defects that are making him do it, general or specific. Meanwhile, on the inside, his aim is only to condemn and cause harm. So he is from the brothers of the hypocrites, those whom Allah has disparaged in his book and in many places. For indeed, Allah disparages those who outwardly display a good action or saying, while intending inwardly to accomplish a mischievous and evil goal. And he has counted that as one of the aspects of hypocrisy, as is stated in Surah Bara, in which he humiliates the hypocrites and exposes their despicable attributes. And he refers here to the verse in the Quran, the English rendition in Surah at tawbah Al-Bara, verse 107, quote, and as for those who set up a masjid in order to cause harm, spread disbelief, disunite the believers and to make it as an outpost for those who made war against Allah and his messenger since aforetime, they will indeed swear that their intention is nothing but good. But Allah bears witness that they are certainly liars. End quote. This particular verse was also um, cited by Sheikh Wasiala Abbas when speaking about the Salafi publications cult splitting from Green Lane and establishing their own centre. But that's another subject. Continuing with the translation of Ibn Rajab's works. And so while discussing these characteristics, it was also quoted. And it is that someone outwardly displays a saying or an action while presenting an image in which he appears to be upon good. Yet his intention in doing that is to accomplish an evil goal. So he is praised for what good he has made manifest outwardly, while accomplishing by it the evil goal he has hidden inwardly. And he basks in the praise he receives for that which he has outwardly portrayed as being good, which is in fact evil on the inside. And he is happy that his evil hidden objective has been achieved. So his benefit is perfected, perfected for him, and his scheme is carried out effectively by this deception. Anyone with this characteristic definitely falls under the threat of this verse, the previous verse I've mentioned. Thus he is threatened with a painful torment. 
An example of this is when someone desires to defame a man, belittle him and expose his faults so that people turn away from him. This is done either because he loves to cause harm to him because of his enmity towards him or because he fears him due to a rivalry that exists between them with regards to wealth, leadership or other blameworthy causes. So he does not find a way towards accomplishing his goal except by publicly degrading him due to some religious reason. Close quote. I want to refer to some other aspects here to really emphasise, again, the toxicity that existed and was being promoted and fuelled and supported, admittedly inadvertently on some occasions, by some of these junior scholars in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere. So continuing, quote, He, the evildoer, manifests and magnifies the scholars or the individual's criticism for the other individual or scholar so that he can fulfill his desire and achieve his goal under the pretense of advising and defending the scholars of the religion, close quote. And we were becoming accustomed to the distorted and misleading phrase that was cited as a mantra to the scholars that they were going to. I've mentioned this in the previous episodes and seasons. They are attacking the Salafis. They are attacking Ahl al-Sunnah wal-Jama'ah. Salafiyah is not a cult. So they place themselves as the criteria for Salafism and Salafis. And by making such misleading statements, by default, were inferring that anyone who criticised them were not Salafi. I will now turn to the year 2013. And on this occasion, I have referred to one of the few diaries that I've kept day to day, week to week, um, my 2013 diary. And I want to refer to some of the more personal local events um, and activities that I was involved in that can provide a microcosmic context as well as the international events that I'd recorded, um, giving that more macro um, perspective. So on Friday the 5th of February, I went to King Abdulaziz airport and collected two friends who were visiting for Umrah. And after they, they freshened up at my home, um, I later took them to Mecca to perform the Umrah while I waited for them. Now, I'm bringing this because I want to refer to season one and the first Umrah that I did in 1992 and where Sheikh Suleiman Abdus Sabor, my mentor, um, picked me up and my colleagues and really hosted us. And that left a very positive impression and impacted upon me very uh, much. So much so that when we came to live in Saudi Arabia, I um, was adamant that we remain in Jeddah. Um, one, because of the close proximity to Mecca. Secondly, because um, it was similar to London in some respects, just more religious. Um, and also to be able to meet friends, families um, and colleagues and host them um, because they're traveling on a very um, momentous occasion, a memorable occasion and coming to a foreign land and often coming to the Middle East for the first time could be quite daunting. So I liked providing that hospitality and seeing a friendly face um, and being there for them as and when needed. And this was the case and continues to be the case with many expats living in Jeddah, not just British expats from, from all over the world. On the 28th of February, an international event I'd like to refer to was that of the Jihad Jain suspect Ali Sharaf Damash being um, extradited or facing extradition to the US from Ireland. And I previously mentioned this individual who was the husband of Jamie Pauline Ramirez, who I represented as an expert witness in her trial in 2014. I mentioned her arrest and um, my involvement with her from um, the previous episode. So he was to be extradited and he was seen as the ringleader of this whole group and I'll read an article from the Independent, um, Irish Independent on the 28th of February. 
Quote, an Algerian arrested following an international probe into an alleged plot to murder Swedish cartoonist Lars Vilks faces extradition to the United States on terrorism charges. Damash was originally arrested in Waterford in March 2010 over the so-called Jihad Jane plot to murder Vilks, who controversially depicted the Prophet Muhammad with the body of a dog. Two others, American woman Jamie Pauline Ramirez, who married Damash the day she arrived in Ireland in September 2009, and Khalid Mohammed, have also pleaded guilty to a range of terrorism charges and all three await sentencing. Um, just at this point, I think that the Muslim world was disgusted at the Lars Vilks depiction of our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. However, this episode is not going to delve into the ensuing uh, re response of the Muslim world um, on this particular occasion. Proceeding to another international event, we see on the 15th of April, the Boston Marathon bomb attacks, where the Zarnath brothers killed three individuals, injuring a further 280. Now, the younger Zarnath, Zohar, was captured a few days later. What was interesting was how he subsequently featured on Rolling Stone magazine's August edition as some sort of rock star. And this caused consternation across the world due to such a depiction. He's currently awaiting the death penalty after being found guilty of these attacks. And this highlights a clear disparity in US law from state to state. Because when we look at the sentencing of Zacharias Massawi after 9-11, witnessed nearly 3,000 deaths and he escaped the death penalty. We contrast that with this incident in which three individuals were killed, yet Zarnif now awaits the death penalty. I will refer to the only conference I participated in in 2013 and that was the National Imam's Consultative Forum in the University of Melbourne, Australia, on the 20th of April. I delivered a presentation online on that occasion. But jumping back to some local events, on the 8th of April at 8 p.m., Tahir Wyatt, who was studying in Medina at the time, visited Jeddah to deliver a lecture at the mosque, which was situated in the old airport vicinity. I attended alongside with my son-in-law on that occasion and later that evening I picked another colleague um, and we accompanied a UK visitor to Mecca once again for Umrah. On Friday the 19th of April at 7pm I attended the regular study circle hosted by Nadia Ahmed, a Canadian um, graduate from Medina. And moving to the 8th of May, I want to refer to the sentencing notice that was issued in the case of the USA versus Jamie Paul and Ramirez, in which her case was set for the 9th of October at 10 a.m. A huge event that continues to have reverberations in the UK today was the shocking murder in broad daylight on the 22nd of May of Fusilier Lee Rigby in Woolwich at the hands of Michael Adebolajo and Michael Adebowali. I remember watching this event and the horrific scenes playing themselves out with these two individuals standing there explaining to bystanders into their mobile phones their rationale for killing this fusilier. Now, unsurprisingly, there was some empathy towards the explanation given by Michael Adebolajo as to why he embarked upon this barbaric act. And it's important to note here that extremists always tap into the grievance of the Muslim world, which I've mentioned many times before, that being the treatment of Muslim 
populations at the hands of the West who have either occupied or invaded Muslim um, countries and territories. And this was one of the causes to which Michael Adebalajo spoke to. However, that in no way can ever justify the reactionary terrorist actions that were witnessed on this occasion, um, which had never been witnessed to this degree before. I remember receiving phone calls from individuals, sisters in tears, who were enraged, who were afraid, who were shocked. And it's important to highlight this because so many times the non-Muslim populace asked where are the Muslims in condemning such actions. And the Muslims have condemned these actions over and over again. Unfortunately, we do not see the same when it's far-right extremists attacking or harming Muslim minorities. And the silence is almost resounding from the wider non-Muslim populace. So what's good for the goose, as we say, is good for the gander. However, this does not, does not play out in this arena of terrorism, whether it's far-right extremism or religious extremism. I received a call the following day uh, by Kurt Barlin from the BBC, and we did a Skype interview regarding the murder. On Saturday the 25th of May, I was called again by the BBC um, for another, yet another interview regarding the Lee Rigby murder. On Friday the 31st of May, I wrote an article for The Guardian. And I want to refer to some aspects of this for those who are unfamiliar with it or have not seen it um, on The Guardian website or indeed my own website. And I stated here, at this stage, we cannot know the mindset of those behind the Woolwich attack. But as a South Londoner and Muslim convert, I feel it necessary to explain the social and religious dynamics at play with many British Muslim converts from an urban background. I went on to explain about the 148 teenage murders in London since 2005 um, and uh, which boroughs were prevalent um, for these, these types of um, crimes. I then went on and I'll quote here, my formative years as a teenager and young adult were during the Brixton, Totsteff and Tottenham riots of the early 80s. I was subjected to the stop and search or sus laws of that era, arrested and thrown in local police stations, jails for hours at a time, only to be released without charge on each occasion. The reason? I was a young black man and therefore must have been up to no good. This was a way of life to which I and many youths of that generation became accustomed. The riots of that era cannot be justified. However, the root causes should be understood. Had I converted to Islam around the time of these events, would I have gravitated to a more militant, violent interpretation of Islam? I would argue that although psychological and social mosaics like mine are clearly influencing factors to how we initially develop as new Muslims, there are defining catalysts that propel an individual from being radical or non-violent to violent. Cycle of violence theories refer to a tipping point. When an individual reaches a point of no return due to an incident or event which pushes them across the threshold to commit a violent or terrorist act. Richard Reed, the shoe bomber's tipping point, was when the war on terror was launched against the Taliban in Afghanistan shortly after the events of 9-11. I went on to describe my experience as chairman of Brixton Mosque and the reason for establishing street strategy to reach, empower and educate teenagers. The articles were received the comments that ensued were quite engaging and were mixed in their impressions of my article, but that was to be expected. On the 16th of June, I've noted in my diary that I had a Skype call between Ilyas Kermani, the co-director of Street, and myself to discuss recent, recent developments. And I want to talk about a calendar event as it relates to Saudi Arabia on the 29th of June, because this was quite unique and on that day the country revised its weekends to incorporate Fridays and Saturdays as opposed to the previous Thursdays and Fridays that um, had been prevalent up until that particular time. On the 9th of September 
I emailed uh, Jamie Paul and Ramirez's lawyer regarding the 9th of October date. And on that same day, I had a Skype meeting with now Dr. Annabelle Inge um, regarding her research on Salafism. And I referred to her book um, that came out in 2017, The Making of a Salafi Woman. On the 12th of September at 9pm, I had a Skype meeting with Quinton Witorovic, again, who I've mentioned, he was the author of the um, typology in which he divided, categorised Salafism into three uh, purists, politicos and jihadis. And we had a discussion on a number of issues at that particular time as well. On the 19th of August, I produced another article for The Guardian entitled Islam's ability to empower is a magnet to black British youth. And I discussed um, the recent Christian seminary in which Muslims came together with Christians to discuss why black British youth were embracing Islam and the challenges uh, around radicalization. On Monday the 16th of September, we saw an attack, a shooting, where 12 people were killed by Aaron Alexis at a Washington DC naval base. However, this was not considered a terrorist attack, despite it being the second deadliest mass shooting at a US military base since the Fort Hood attack, in which Major, Major Nadal was um, uh, the suspect and the culprit. This was a pattern and a trend that Muslims were becoming familiar with, that when it was a non-Muslim, a non-Brown individual, media and security were slow to label such attacks as terrorists. However, if it was a Muslim sounding individual of brown complexion or black complexion, it was immediately highlighted and labeled as a terrorist incident. That's a discussion for another occasion as well, because there's a lot that can be said around that. On Thursday, the 10th of October, I received an update regarding Jamie Paul and Ramirez's case that it would be postponed until January 2014. On the 1st of November, I received an email from Panorama because they wanted to do a special on Woolwich. And Peter Taylor had been in contact with me concerning that. Now, I want to highlight an email that I'd written to him about concerns we had. And I mentioned on that same date. Hello, Peter. Thanks for your email. I did explain to Mubeen the reluctance of colleagues to participate. I also explained to him how some of them felt put off by what they felt was the persistence which you and your team would pursue them to meet or discuss the programme. Please understand that while we acknowledge that you are putting together a documentary, we have been misrepresented, misquoted, and on occasions willfully misunderstood. I referred to the media outlets that had done this, and I suggested to him that he proceed with the interview I myself had done with him earlier, um, and that my colleagues would be watching to see how that was edited and the subsequent portrayal in the Panorama documentary, which was to come out in 2014. The success of that documentary was such that Peter wrote to me a year later, almost a year later, and I want to skip to that email that he sent me. And he mentioned on the 6th of October, 2014, hello, Abdul Haq, I hope you are well. The good news is that I've be just been awarded a BAFTA for my work. I will send you the details separately. Our work together on the murder of Gunnar Lee Rigby would have greatly helped me achieve it. I can't thank you enough. So to show where the success for journalists and media outlets, outlets was based in part upon them accessing um, Muslim communities for resources, for information, is seen in this subsequent email that I received from Peter a year later. On Thursday the 10th of November, I spoke to yet another media outlet, Sky News, and their reporter Ashish Joshi contacted me on that particular occasion. And I'd like to touch with some light-hearted news on Wednesday the 4th of December because my 
favourite team Liverpool beat Norwich 5-1 and Luis Suarez scored four goals and Raheem Sterling won. We went on on a roll of that particular occasion to beat West Ham on the 7th of December 4-1 and Spurs on the 14th of December 5-0. I thought I'd put that in as a side point um, for a light moment because it was noted in my diary. Proceeding to a more serious and international event, we look at Thursday the 5th of December to see that the icon and legend Nelson Mandela died that evening. And I want to refer again to the first season in which I highlighted our joy at Nelson Mandela being released after 27 or so years captivity in South Africa under the apartheid regime when we drove around Trafalgar Square past the South African embassy tooting our horns and shouting out of the window. I was a Muslim at that time, but this was a very significant um, event for me as a young black man um, in the West. I also want to recall watching Idris Elba and his emotional address on the evening of Mandela's death because the new movie he featured in, entitled Mandela, was premiering that particular night. A few days later, on Tuesday the 10th of December, we witnessed Baba Ahmed pleading guilty to a terrorism charge from the US. And it's important to highlight the convenience with which many overlooked his guilt on this occasion and instead portrayed him as an innocent hero and victim of brutality when he suffered um, uh, violence at the hands of the police when they raided his home in Tutin before his extradition for these particular charges. And then moving to Thursday the 19th of December where we saw Michael Adebolajo and Michael Adebolawi found guilty for the murder of Lee Rigby. And as we draw to a conclusion, it's interesting to juxtapose Baba Ahmed and the Adabalajo, Adabalawe radicalization processes and the eras in which this took place. Because with Ahmed, that occurred when seeds were being planted during the 90s. And with Adabalajo and Adabalawe, that took place in the noughties. And the only consistency that was witnessed regarding counter-narratives across these two decades was from none other than the Salafi communities. The government and other entities were continually trying to catch up and redevelop, introduce, redesign strategies to combat the organic and fluid nature of violent extremism and terrorism. And this was highlighted in the final article that I want to read from um, in order to conclude this particular episode. The English edition of Le Monde Diplomatique presented an article called UK's Flawed Counterterrorism Strategy on the 9th of December by Nafis Mossadegh Ahmed. Government advisers, counter-extremism officials and current and former civil servants confirm that the UK government's counter-terrorism strategy is failing to tackle the danger of violent extremism. Rather, it is exacerbating the threat of domestic terrorism. These officials attribute the failure of a fundamentally flawed approach to counter-terrorism strategy inspired by a UK anti-extremism think tank, the Quilliam Foundation. An advisor to Charles Farr, Director of the Office for Security and Counterterrorism, OSCT, in the Home Office, said that Farr was warned three years ago of the possibility of an attack in the UK, similar to the killing of soldier Lee Rigby in Woolwich, South East London, that later took place on the 22nd of May 2013. The OSCT advisor, an independent counter-radicalisation expert, who has worked with many government agencies, wrote on the 31st of May 2013 to General Sir David Richards, then Chief of the Defence Staff and the most senior military advisor to the Defence Secretary and Prime Minister. In his letter, he describes a meeting in Birmingham on the 27th of January 2010. He organised between FAR, other OSCT officials and five young Muslims who were amongst those most at risk of radicalisation. 
The letter describes how Far asked the young men about their feelings and aspirations. Moving on further along the letter, I'll quote from there, quote, The letter criticised the government's decision to cut funding to street, strategy to reach, empower and educate teenagers, a South London counter radicalization organisation engaging alienated young Muslims outside mainstream institutions, especially those involved in gang culture. Some of the blame has to be levelled at the new coalition government. They revised the agenda and cut funding to street, a credible outreach project assisting and guiding black converts and Muslim gang men members. Ostensibly, one of the Woolwich perpetrators were known to them. I strongly believe had their program been operational, the Woolwich incident could have been averted. Close quote. Another section of this article highlighted Whitehall's hand in Quilliam, and I'll quote from that. Former Whitehall officials confirmed that the failure to understand the role of gang culture and foreign policy grievances in radicalisation is linked to the government's relationship with the Quilliam Foundation, a counter-extremism think tank founded by former Muslim extremists Ed Hussein and Majid Nawaz in 2008. A leaked Quilliam briefing paper to Charles Farr in June 2010, reviewing the government's preventing violent extremism, prevent policies, claimed, quoting from the leaked report, the ideology of non-violent Islamists is broadly the same as that of violent Islamists. They disagree only on tactics, close quote. The paper was particularly critical of the view that the government partnerships with non-violent yet otherwise extreme Islamists were the best way to fend off jihadism. Among those Quilliam flagged up, as sharing the ide ideology of terrorists were grassroots organisations like Street, peaceful Muslim groups like the Islamic Society of Britain, politicians like Salma Yaqub, and even Scotland Yard's Muslim Contact Unit. Close quote. In conclusion of this particular episode, it's important to highlight the dilemma facing us societally when we see governments continuing to refer and rely upon the input from former extremist entities to combat and tackle existing challenges of extremism, while ignoring those who continue to be in the field and most experienced at countering extremism, having done so for the past 30 years.